Hello. How are you? Fantastic. I nice. Um, well, thank you so much for making some time and being here today. We're super excited. Um, I know we're not in person. We usually have like a sort of pizza there and we'd ask you questions with, you know, a little homely environment, but because of COVID, we had to change our circumstances. So what do you feel about pineapple pizza? I'm okay with pineapple pizza if there's jalapenos on it too. You got to balance the sweet with a little spicy or a little bitter. So yeah. my name's Nama. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a junior. My name is Lily. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm also a junior. My name is Bonnie. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm also a junior. I'm Francesca. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm currently on, um, I just want to do a land acknowledgement quick. I am at the Capitol, which is on occupied Ho-Chunk, stolen Ho-Chunk land. Mm -hmm. And we just want to get to know you and just want to start off with what has your career in public service been like and why have you been interested in being elected official? So the past four and a half weeks have been tumultuous, overwhelming, terrifying, and um, also immensely satisfying because we are trying to stay grounded in constituent work and trying to help as many people as we can in this uh, incredibly absurd uh, time. I ran for public office because I think we are at a juncture um, where there is a small opportunity to make big moves in terms of pushing progressive policy, in terms of increasing representation, in terms of amplifying youth voices, and really working with a coordinated and collaborated um, response to changing kind of the, the political paradigm through cultural shifting. And I think um, to see someone like me in office that doesn't have a political background, that doesn't come from the traditional, you know, run for a smaller city, like run for city council or make your way up from like, you know, being on county exec. And, and you know, I come from, uh, I'm, I, I'm a single mom, I, I have a small business. I am trying to stay uh, in community and, and center care in everything that I do and center equity in, I, in everything I do. And I think we need politicians that are relatable, that uh, understand the lived experiences of the working poor, the working class, the working family, the working individual. And, and I was in crisis, you know, our business was shut down. I didn't know what was happening with my income. I saw harm happening all around me in my community, but I also saw immense resilience. So I, I thought in a time of, you know, this, a time of crisis is also a time of opportunity. And this was an opportunity for new leadership. And so I really embraced that and, and tried to uh, campaign that the best I could. So kind of bouncing off that, I know you ran your campaign last summer um, and it was in a time of like, so much going on with the political climate, COVID-19, Black Lives Movement, there was so much going on. How was the process and how, this was your first campaign? The campaign process, the campaign experience was a gratifying chaos. Um, we wanted our team to be reflective of our unique experiences and most of our experiences were not in political campaigns. And so I think what that did was that really made us rely on being a true grassroots movement and and getting you know we didn't have the network for those the the larger political donors we didn't know how to maneuver all that we knew that we needed to um run on run with a campaign that wasn't centered on me i think we wanted it to be about community we wanted it to be about care and we wanted it to be about equity and we wanted to let folks know that our slogan of sharing the table is was was one that uh, was really about not taking narratives and not co-opting narratives, but amplifying the lived experiences of those that were doing work in the community, you know, and, and really showing folks that government can look different, but I'm going to bring creativity and innovation here, um, using kind of the strengths and experiences that I had in the hospitality industry, that I put service to others above all else, and that, you know, we're engaging in conversation, um, using social media, um, doing cooking classes, and, and 
just really making it about community conversations, you know, campaigning during a time where there are so many different needs and demands, but there's also, I think, a centralized message that we wanted to amplify, which is that what community care and what community strength and what, what equity looks like is figuring out ways to amplify all of these stories. I think bringing that sense of, of, you know, how important representation is, but that representation with accountability is the type of representation that matters. So I was honest that I wanted folks to hold me accountable to the things that I was saying and promising that I, that I wanted folks to be able to reach me and I wanted to be a responsive leader. And, and in the end, centering community, centering care, centering equity was a type of leadership that I think folks hadn't seen before. And that's what was really and continues to be needed during these types of absurd times. That's wonderful. And I think you worded that beautifully. And, and I'm really glad that you're bringing this community voice into your platform, into your policies. Um, I'm so excited to see what you do in the future. So. Do you have any advice for students looking to get more involved in politics and in the government? Yeah, so I would say local government has a lot more influence, um, especially at the, at the city and county level than people recognize when it comes to your transportation, when it comes to housing accessibility. There are certain things that the state restricts, but there are a lot of things that can be changed still at the local level. So, you know, finding internships at city council, going to those city council meetings, you know, commenting. And if it isn't a process and you, you have questions, be loud about why things are the way things are. Um, I know that with, with city council meetings being online right now, it, it can seem more accessible to folks, but there's no reason why people are off video and then they can't allow folks, you know, who are speaking to be on video there. Um, we need to be, uh, you know, working with um, more youth leaders. And so I think if, if you're interested in becoming a youth leader in, in government and in, in uh, getting a uh, active politically, you know, reach out to your, your local university um, student organizations. Um, and there's also neighborhood associations. There's one in every neighborhood. And I think that those neighborhood associations are mostly run by older white men and women. And, you know, in, in the neighborhood that I live in Tenny Lapham, like we have been trying to recruit, you know, young folks and, and folks who are really um, are rooted in, in community care and mutual aid and understanding that, um, yeah, that, you know, bringing um, policies that are going to give more folks uh, uh, self-determination is, is the direction we need to be moving. Um, we need folks, we need those voices in neighborhood association meetings. So speaking of the younger folks in society, what do you think are the most important things of for younger people to know about how the government actually functions? It doesn't function well. And it always, it needs to function better. And it's only going to function better if we constantly challenge the way things are done and to be persistent and to be resistant to the way things are done as well. Um, I think that the youth voice is oftentimes the most marginalized and dismissed when it should be the most amplified because y'all have the most at stake, right? The policies that are being shaped now are going to impact generations. And so, and I think oftentimes young people aren't given the credit of like, when I was in high school, I was not as in tune or as aware or as active as I'm seeing, you know, folks in high school, middle school, elementary school, you know, the conversations surrounding um, the race class narrative about doing anti-racist work, um, students being involved in, in shaping, wanting to shape their curriculum, um, how discipline is done. I think that, how um, the, the most important thing in the end for everyone to remember is that government, government can and should always function better and that uh, it's, it's really, we are going to rely on the youth voices to bring in the energy, the knowledge, the, and the, um, I, I think the, the, the experiences that uh, folks 
who are in positions of power often don't think about. Um, for the next question, uh, what is your vision for the future of Wisconsin? My vision for Wisconsin is one where everyone feels like they belong. I think especially being Asian American, um, the, the figuring out your identity is, uh, is fluid and, and constantly like, it's a very melancholy process because we have, especially like me, I'm I'm lighter skinned. Colorism is very real, and in 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 and Asians have, um, especially Koreans, we we have our own internalized biases. And I think, um, oftentimes, what happens is is you try to assimilate to different groups of people, and but you never really, especially when, um, you know, when you're not white, there's this there's still a sense that you don't always belong if you're not, if you're in the minority. And so my vision for Wisconsin is one where everyone feels like they belong, where everyone feels like they can um, have control of their own safety. And it's, it's one that's, again, just celebrates diversity, um, understands that it's our strength, that wherever you are in Wisconsin, um, you feel safe. Um, and so I think to get there, we have to eliminate racism. It's, it's a, it's, it may seem like a dream, but if we don't have that as our North Star, we're never going to make that progress. And so quite simply put, a Wisconsin where everyone feels like they belong in Wisconsin um, is one that I think is going to be the best Wisconsin. Yeah, and I think leaders such as you who promote that message can get it out and more people can hear you and then hear people who aren't white and people of color. So I think it's very helpful to have leaders have that vision so then the citizens can also feel that way. So for our last question, why do you think students should take time out of their busy high school, middle school, elementary schedules to learn about the government? Because government can be sneaky as hell and it can impact your life when you least expect it. And it can also be silent for a very long time. Um, different levels of privilege are, I think, how people have more control over the impact of, of government and policy in their life. Um, so it's important that uh, students recognize that, you know, you want to stay informed so you have that kind of control and agency of, of how much you want it to be a part of your life. We have a responsibility right now to um, talk about how important it is to stay engaged, to, to stay active, and to have difficult conversations about, um, you know, the, the why we continue to live in a, a, a state, in a country that um, thrives off oppressing others. And, you know, government policy really shapes all of those things. And so um, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's imperative really that we all stay engaged because we all need your voice. And I think um, sometimes political leaders don't recognize how much we need the youth voice. So, you know, unfortunately the ask of, of leaders like me for y'all is, is to um, push to, to have sharp elbows, to make yourselves be heard and, and be unapologetic about it because it's, you're, it's, you have the most at stake. Um, and if you don't have leaders who see and understand that, you can become the leader that does. And that starts with engagement. So thank you so much. I think this is all we have. And we were really grateful to have you here and hearing your insight. We're really excited for your next steps, your first elected official appointment. I'm, I'm excited. I'm ready for change. I'm ready for these local representatives to actually represent us and represent our voice. And we need people like you. And thank you all for, for staying engaged and for, um, you know, providing me, like at the end of the day, you feel very depleted sometimes in, in some of the conversations that are happening. And this was very invigorating. So I'm grateful. Thank you again. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye.